Okay, let's get going. Welcome everybody on another glorious winter day in paradise. Um, so, uh, last time we met, we've been to, since last time we met, we've been to the Assistive Technology Fair in the, in the Gate Lab. Uh, looked like everybody had a good time. Does anybody have any fond memories to, uh, to present to us? What was your, your, the best thing you saw at the fair? I, saw, I know a lot of people had a lot of fun. Osea? The lever drive wheelchair? What was the name of the company? Roto Mobility. Okay. Anybody else have a great time? What, what? Oh, as a vendor, how, how did it go for you? I had a great time. It was nice yes. To chat with students. Okay, that's good. How about the, uh, the Alexander? Uh, I want to make a comment on kind of a, a side conversation I had with one of the vendors. I, I forget the name of the company, but they have uh, basically this do this app that they were showcasing. Um, oh. And kind of, I, I had a really interesting conversation with them about how um, the, the choice to go Android first um, is, is getting a lot of backlash from the, the Silicon Valley community, but at the same time, if it was made as a, a conscious decision, just getting the largest reach in terms of their target audience of people. Yes. So th th that company was um, Brain Brain Aid, and their product is Pete. It's a uh, app that can schedule your time for you. So if you um, have problems scheduling or you have uh, uh, memory impairments, uh, that would be a great product uh, for you, for you. So that's been in. They've been working on that for years and years, and, and they've tested it with the folks at the VA. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting product. Uh, Fred? I just returned from India where I visited the Jaipur foot factory where they make artificial limbs. Absolutely fascinating to see how quickly and inexpensive it is. That's great. Okay. 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 That's great. Uh, anybody else have any comments? Okay, we'll move on. So um, we got the evaluation forms and class sign-up sheet, which you know about. Um, so one of the things at the Gate Lab that um, you didn't really get a chance to, to see is these um, markers that they use on, on, on the body. And so they use it to uh, um, as a marker to figure out where that particular part of your, your body is. Um, in 3D space as you walk. So um, it's, it's actually tape over, uh, put over a, a spear, and the tape actually has embedded in it these um, small uh, three-dimensional mirrors, 3D mirrors, and it's a corner, it's a corner. So 2D, it's a, it's, um, a two-dimensional corner, so any ray of light that comes in here gets bounced back in exactly the same direction. Uh, from, from any angle. And the 3D version does the same thing in three dimensions. So that's a corner re reflector. Uh, there's an array of these on the moon that the astronauts put there. It comes in tape, so if you see guys working on the highway with reflective vests, that's what it's made out of, and they put it over uh, the balls as well. So the property of um, is called ret retroreflectivity. And this is what it looks like when you take a flash picture of it. So it's, it stands out very well. So they have the cameras that produce the, the light, um, illuminate these things, and, they can, and all the cameras you know, check out the position of the ball with their camera, and then there's a bunch of equations that figure out exactly where it is in three-dimensional space and in time. So that's how that works. So this is the last call for uh, Maker Fair Tickets. As an instructor, I get 20% off through tomorrow. Um, so if, um, if you're a student, um, I guess even an adult, I can get 20% uh, discount tickets. So, but I need to know because I'm going to be ordering them tomorrow. <coughs> so um, 
And if you haven't been to Maker Fair, it's an event to go to. It's a lot of fun, especially if you like being around <coughs> a lot of people. So uh, check that out. Yes. Uh, Saturday and Sunday. Oh. So when you buy a ticket, you can use it either for Saturday or Sunday. And then there's a different plan if you want to go both days. OK. Where's it held? It's always held at the, um, the fairgrounds in uh, San Mateo, you know, by where the racetrack used to be. OK. So let me know about that. So next Tuesday, we will not be in this room. We'll be in the atrium of the Peterson Building, which is nearby. And we're going to see a couple movies. Uh, one of them is called Stumped, and the other one is called Fixed. Um, so we're going to set up chairs in the atrium, and we're going to have um, maybe get some popcorn and uh, look at a couple of uh, uh, films and, and uh, discuss them afterwards. Okay. So um, I've seen I've seen both of these many times, and they're very very interesting. So I highly recommend them. So be there for that. Today we have a double header. Uh, we have two speakers. Uh, Jules will speak first, and then uh, Shah will talk. So we're going to get right into uh, Jules' presentation, and then we'll have a break, and then Shah will have her turn. Okay? So just a moment to move things around. Oops, I'm not giving you. I'm not giving you. And then I'll. Then I'll Introduce you. Let's get your slide. Okay. you are uh, working on some very fun projects. Um, so the program for this talk is a little bit about myself and my background, um, examples of the work I've done in my past, and then um, uh, some examples of personal electronic response system um, designs and a few other uh, things. Thanks. So. Um, I'm a classically trained industrial designer. I have a BFA in industrial design from Rhode Island School of Design. And then I worked for about 15 years and I came back to school when I was a little bit older and got my master's degree in design. And so what I've really focused on in the past was your standard consumer products um, that you might find at a clothing store, or a hardware store, or Bloomingdale's, or stuff like that. So that's my background. And um, you might recognize these design icons, no? Right, right. Which uh, they created a number of very innovative furniture pieces between the 40s and the 70s, 1940s, 1970s. But I wanted to show you this um, because this is probably the most beautiful leg splint ever made, in my opinion. 
uh, it was developed at the request of the U.S. Navy during World War II, and it was a modular and, and easy to produce, mass produced product. Uh, so this is really where their legend began. And they perfected this technique of steam bent um, wood, plywood, and they went on after this splint design to produce a number of furniture pieces you probably recognize using the same technique. Uh, so after many years of splints and cumbersome casts to uh, help people who have broken bones, this is the Cortex exoskeleton design. It provides a highly technical and trauma zone localized support system. It's easily ventilated. You can take a shower in this. It's recyclable, um, hygienic. And I think stylish. It's a lot better than the cast that I wore as a kid when I broke my wrist, which smelled really bad and um, was falling apart everywhere, the plaster. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate this from an aesthetic point of view. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, this is a company called Bespoke. They're local, and uh, one of the reasons I really like this company is they are creating prosthetic devices that are really on the opposite side of the spectrum of trying to blend in. They're going the complete opposite way. So they're using materials and manufacturing methods that I find really fascinating. And um, like this particular piece here, I, I think looks like a piece of fine jewelry. And I just love how it becomes part of this woman's um, expression of herself. And that's really what I think is possible with aesthetics and assistive technologies. Um, you, can, you can help people actually enjoy wearing things like this when you bring the aesthetics into it. Uh, this is a different company that's like the on the other side of that spectrum, it's a company in the UK called Realistic Prosthetics. And um, they're focused on copying exactly you know, what might be missing on the person that they're working with. And it's just a different way of approaching the problem. It's equally beautiful, I think. It's just in, in a different kind of way. So when you think about assistive technologies, I mean, it can run the gamut of so many products and industries, um, even contact lenses. I mean, it can, those can be improved aesthetically and help someone express who they are by maybe even adding color. Canes. Canes have changed quite a bit over the years, if you look at the history of canes. But um, you know, you can buy something fairly inexpensive that could help you um, feel better about carrying a cane and not make you feel old, not make you feel like uh, it's um, something you want to hide, but maybe something you want to show off. So this is a company, really interesting company that grew out of Stanford called Compact Cath. Have any of you heard of it? So um, people who need um, urine catheters, you usually have to carry around a number of these types of packages. They're large, bulky, and they make a lot of noise when you open them. And one of the things that is sort of on the top three list of these people who need this product is that it be discreet. 61%. So Compact Calf decided to address this problem. It is an aesthetic problem. It's a functional problem too, but it's, it's also how it looks and feels. So they created a catheter that someone could slip into their pocket very, very easily. It's not bulky. Doesn't make a lot of sound when you open it. So if you're in somebody's house and they have a bathroom and you're close to wherever other people are, they might you know, hear you opening something and it might feel embarrassing for someone, but it's very quiet to open. So this is what their finished product looked like. 
I mean, it's a lot different than this, right? From a packaging perspective and from just, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful product now. Because thought was put into what it looked like. Thought was put into what was needed uh, from a human standpoint. These are the people who worked on that product. They're, um, David Jenka actually works over in, at the D School. He's a faculty there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I worked on here in this class and then uh, how I continued that work past this class. So do any of you, look, so PERS is the short word for the acronym for Personal Electronic Response System. So you might know this type of product from the commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. There's a lot of companies that make these products. Um, these are images of some of the products today that are on the market. While I was a student at Stanford, I was also a volunteer at Lytton Gardens, which is a, um, a residential community in Palo Alto for older adults. And it's a government subsidized uh, facility. And I decided to volunteer there because several of my projects here at Stanford revolved around the older adult community. And I wanted to learn more about those, that age group and what their habits were and what they enjoyed to do, what they did enjoy to do. And one thing I noticed when I was there volunteering was that everybody at Lytton Gardens is, giving a, is given a personal electronic response system device when they, when they go there. Do they end up wearing them? Do you think? No. They are hanging on their bedposts. They are hanging on their doorknobs in their rooms. They are not wearing them. Why? There's three reasons. They're ugly. They make them feel old. And um, they broadcast to the world that they need help. That was their perception of the product. And I would tend to agree. So in this class, what I did was I set out to think about this device differently. And I limited my user group to older women. And I created a, a, a series of jewelry pieces that theoretically could hide that same tech that was in their current PERS device, but put it into like a stylish jewelry product that somebody old, somebody not even older, but just any, you know, any woman might want to wear. Uh, so these are the prototypes. If you want to see them closer, you can see them in the Peterson building. They're in like a, a glass case when you walk in to the right. Uh, um, so after I took this class and finished that project, I wanted to take it a step further and wanted to uh, create something that was easier to bring to market. So I looked, looked at devices that were already out there, and the best device, in my opinion, was Great Call. Uh, they're down in San Diego. And I also thought about this company called Jealous Skins, which is in Canada. And you might know them. They make stickers that are removable for your tech devices. And I thought maybe by combining these two, uh, the, the Jealous Skins with the Great Call device, we could have a, a larger array of uh, choices for people who need to use this device so you can personalize it potentially. So here's the device as it is today and then somebody could potentially, you know, choose a, a specific design sticker to make it look less medical and more like something, you know, that expresses who they are, the colors they like. So I had Jealous Skins actually make me um, custom designs that I created. And at this point, I was focused on children and the market for children uh, for this type of, of device. So I was talking to a lot of parents, a lot of kids, and created a, a belt based on the feedback I was getting from parents um, to sort of hide what this device does. It's a single call button that connects, that connects you to a medical call center in, the, um, in this case. 
But then I also made my own device design, and this one was a wrist-worn product that could potentially have various types of um, different style wristbands and then different stickers you could put on top. This design was like a single button, like Great Call, but instead of calling a medical center, it would call a caregiver, like your mom or dad or your grandma or whoever was caring for that child. And then there's an LED light that, that lights up when you're, it's in use. Um, these were the physical pro prototypes I created of those for testing with my users, which were kids between um, 6 and 11. So that was another thing I really focused on here in this class was um, listening to the user and really doing a lot of ethnography work and getting out there and understanding what people really want and not um, imposing my own ideas on what you know, what the product could, would be. But to really let, when you're doing it right, in other words, when you're doing it right, you are sort of the catalyst. And every, all the people that you're talking to are actually designing your product. You're just, you're the energy that brings that, in, you bring it in, and you're the energy that, you know, brings out a product or an idea. And to me, that's true design. You're really solving a problem when you're doing that. So um, I continued to work for Great Call. They hired me after I graduated as a consultant, and I created some um, accessories for their, their current device. And then it's funny how things work, but once you're in like a little niche area, people start to talk. And um, this company, QMedic Health, grew out of MIT. And QMedic Health heard about what I was doing and they <coughs> hired me to work on their product, which looks like that currently. But what they wanted to do was um, personal, help make personalization possible with their product. So um, in this case, I really created another jewelry piece, essentially. And the idea was you could. Um, get a quote engraved on the outside of that face that meant something to your mom or your dad, and the inside could be just a design that reflects the style of the person wearing it. And in this case, the, the button is the center design. This was for Cumetic Health as well. It's a clip design. It could clip on a vari various types of bands um, or your belts. This design has a space to put in a photo of your grandkid, or your dog, or your spouse, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend. And then, funny thing happened, somebody else called me to help them work on this type of wearable product. It was Salutron, they're a local company. And their product is really a fitness tracker, but it's targeted to the older adult market, and it's sold, it was sold only at like Walgreens, you know, big pharmaceutical companies. So you can see like the blister pack packaging is pretty ugly and the graphics are specific type of, looks like pharma, pharmaceutical, you know, looking. And they wanted to get into a, a younger market. Instead of selling at Walgreens, they want to sell at Fry's. So I was trying to translate the tech they had, which was really just a fitness tracker, into something that might be more um, attractive for a younger market. And so we came up with this. And so this is actually on the market now. Sold at Fry's. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to you know, show you a few assistive technology devices here that, you know, they don't work, but I find them incredibly boring to, to, to look at. Like, I, I think there's a lot of possibilities with you know, products like this in terms of aesthetics and how one might be able to uh, personalize it and express oneself um, when they need to use a product such, such as these. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say that uh, my work has taken a turn and I'm actually now focused on assistive technologies for uh, mothers who are in uh, high risk uh, birth situations. So um, 
I started this lactation support product several years ago. I'm still working on it. But I've also started working at Center for Pediatric and Perinatal Education. It's called CAPE. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a simulation lab. It's across the street from the hospital, from the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. And we actually, I helped that group, that clinical group, write a grant about a year and a half ago. We won the grant. It's like a $4 million grant, NIH grant. And we are now working on improving safety and outcomes for mothers in high-risk birth situ scenarios. And so we are um, looking at um, assistive technology in labor and delivery rooms. And we're looking at um, assistive technologies for clinicians to do their jobs better. So it's really a fascinating um, area as well. So that, that completes my talk. Does anyone have questions? So are, are these mothers uh, disabled themselves, or are these uh, physicians disabled, or what's it called? assistive technologies for that population? Yes, the answer is yes. Oh, I'll some of them are, yeah. Um, well, some of them are, uh, in one case, one was morbid, morbidly obese, and she couldn't walk um, because of the weight. Um, Another mother had um, a mobility uh, a mobility challenge. I'm not sure what that was, but um, those are some of the cases we're looking at. But we're also looking at um, you know moms who are uh, you know going to hemorrhage or you know that that kind of thing. But, so is pregnancy defined as a disabling condition? Well, that's a really you know that's a really good question. And personally, I think no, but I think in our uh, medical environment that we're in, the answer would, would be yes, because they act as if you are ill when you check into a hospital when you are pregnant. And so that is sort of the, the protocol of, of how birth is addressed these days in, in modern hospitals, unfortunately, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when I came to Stanford, uh, I did know that I needed to change my path in design because I was not being fulfilled with what I was doing. And uh, having had myself a very challenging hospital experience prior to entering grad school, uh, I was really wanting to focus on health and wellness products. So that's kind of my, that was sort of evolution. When you're working in the different companies, uh, were you in charge of finding and contacting users? Um, and did it differ between the different companies? Yes, I was in charge in some cases for running ethnography, definitely. Um, and then what, and did it, I'm sorry, what oh, was How did it differ um, between the companies? Oh, how did it differ between the companies? Yeah. Um, you mean the experience of the the different or the different company? You mean in terms of how you find your users? Or yeah. So there's companies that actually uh, assist you in finding the right demographic. So actually, I was uh, given the contact information of that company in, in San Francisco, and I told them the age, the um, of people we needed to talk to, and they found all those people for me, and then I would run the interviews. And then I had a transcriber that transcribed all the interviews. And then I would highlight all the, 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 the quotes that stood out to me, like the insights, and then I would create a report before I started the, the actual design work. So that's kind of how it, it works. So that's part of the process. Yeah. That's what's called ethnography, right? Ethnography, yeah. Yeah. And I love doing that as a designer. That's the front end of design, where you're like gathering all the information, synthesizing it, and pulling those really interesting insights out from the people that you're talking to. For me, that's like, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, do your ethnographic practices tend to uh, be age group dependent? 
and then do you kind of ask, uh, tend to ask different questions and depending on what you're talking about or run your or interviews differently more generally? Well, for these companies, yes, because some companies were targeting a certain like age group, and some were tar targeting a different, age, you know, different age groups. So yeah, um, uh, that's definitely true. Like, the companies are interested in specific age groups. Yes. Um, and then, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, basically, I, I was wondering, are, are there significant differences in terms of how you run your interviews when you do Yeah. To an older age group versus a, a mother's age group. Yeah, there's definitely big differences. Like if you're talking to an eight-year-old versus if you're talking to an 80-year-old. Yeah. You know, you have, to, you have to massage your questions to uh, appeal or, or, first of all, your questions need to be open-ended so that your, your interviewee doesn't answer yes or no, right? But you have to think about compelling open-ended questions for the different age groups. So, yeah. Do you have a favorite question that you like to ask? Yes. Tell me a story about when you ba da 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 da. The stories are where you get to like the nitty gritty and people go on and on and on and on and it's great because you can you can get pretty deep with the story. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that you've worked with, you know, many different companies that iterations in the same space. And so how do you while maintaining continuity of like what works best? I think it, it really just depended on uh, how the company framed it for me. Like, for example, Salutron wanting to get out of Walgreens and into Fry's, but being at a specific price point versus, say, Qmedic Health that was starting from scratch, you know, because they were a startup out of MIT. They just wanted, they understood that personalization was important and they just wanted to make something high-end looking. Yeah. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yes? Oh, uh, since there's no more questions, let's thank Jules for it. We'll take about a five-minute break. And so, if you haven't signed in yet, now.
Uh, hi, my name is Xia uh, Yao, and I'm very glad to be invited here to share my experience developing uh, eWell, which is a tableware set developed for people with special needs, uh, especially uh, those who have cognitive and motor impairments. And I have a video. <laughs> video first? Yes. Okay. I have a short video um, which um, um, I created last year, and because I ran, um, I run a successful crowdfunding campaign by showing this to people. So I would like to show it to you. prototype here. I'll put, uh, put it here later so you can have a look. And I would like to show you some of the steps. Oh, sorry. Step on this. Yeah. Okay. 
I would show. Uh, I would like to share you uh, some tips I have learned during the process. So first, when I was uh, the first step is I when I was uh, try to uh, define my problems. I actually uh, find some problems, uh, smaller ones, a lot of small problems. Then I step back a little bit to try to see a bit bigger scope of it. For example, when I uh, um, when I was uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to work on, um, I just think about uh, what kind of problem a person with dementia can have during the whole day. So I didn't focus on the eating at, at the, uh, in the very beginning. So I divided those uh, problems I discovered. Then I, dis uh, I go ask my target users which direction they can feel like they can benefit more. So I think it's um, some uh, like small tips. And the second step, uh, when I was um, doing my research, I definitely uh, read a lot of uh, articles, but uh, what's also very important is, is what Joel say that uh, making, uh, I will suggest you to making connections with professionals in your field. For example, when I uh, was working on my um, project, I uh, tried to volunteer in the daycare center and where I know like professional, uh, uh, like occupational therapists, doctors, nurses, and social workers, they all are very knowledgeable. And I can uh, use their knowledge and to try to figure out uh, what should I focus on or um, what I should be aware of when I design, do the design. And I think it's very important. And the third step is when I was like um, drawing sketches, making my mock-ups, and that's when you realize the second step is very important because when you have some mock-ups and have some sketches, have many like crazy ideas, you can just bring those ideas to back to ask your professionals if they like it, if they think it is uh, feasible in the future, if they really think it can help the, your target users to have better quality of life. And the first step is about uh, the material and process because uh, if you really want to make your product solid, you really have to focus on this. For example, when I was um, go through the manufacturing process, and I realized my design has two materials. One is PP material, an overmold a silicone rubber. And I think it's pretty, it looks great, and when I render the model, but, uh, when I talked to the manufacturer, they actually told me like, oh, these two materials actually are hard to combine with each other. So you better change your material or you have to change your design. So it's the first thing. And next is how to bring it well to market. Actually, this question is not me want to bring it uh, to the market in the very beginning. Because those professionals I work with or those uh, caregivers I work with, they just keep asking me. So. We have been working together for a long time. So how, how do you think about it? Because I think uh, they all told me like uh, they think it's really a feasible way to help people to eat better. And it's very important. And can I just uh, keep going? Because I was just a student at that time when I developed a project. So that's a really big challenge to me, for me. Because um, when I just graduated from school, I uh, worked for a guitar design company. I didn't really make uh, money to sustain my living. So how can I bring my product to market and without, with very low funding? So besides my work, this is what exactly I was doing every day. So I tried to pitch to everyone I meet, met. For example, when I <laughs> took a bus, and I talk to the uh, bus driver and say, hey, uh, do you know, I was working on a project about uh, a tableware set which can help people with Alzheimer's and what do you think about it? And people, uh, actually people who really don't know about you, sometimes they'll give you very true opinions. They'll, they may be, they'll say, hey, yeah, I know about Alzheimer's, but I don't really know about how your products can work. And by doing this, I can also practice um, how to like pitch my product to uh, um, 
uh, better. For, uh, I can practice my elevator pitch. And the second, I also found some information online and to attend uh, as much uh, um, networking events. And, the, and in this way, in, for doing this, I know uh, I am able to know many entrepreneurs who are also working on their uh, products. So which is very cool. So because I can um, also sh um, ask them some questions, um, how they start their own business, and what should I be aware of. And then I also found um, there is also many organizations such as uh, SBA, a Small Business Association. They offer like free uh, scheduled classes to teach people about like very basic um, business law and also like how to do email marketing things for free. And also I have to figure out my funding parts and I realize I can either go for a VC or I found an angel funder or I do a crowdfunding campaign or I ask my family and friends to donate some money to me. Yeah, and I also have to be aware of the legal part, which is um, I uh, have to protect my uh, design ideas. So I file my provisional patent, and which can protect my idea for one year. And also, at that time, I start um, to uh, establish my startup that year. And also do uh, like very small marketing. And I'm glad that one of the marketing strategy, which is to attend the, the um, competition, design competition, works. So this is, um, I'm, I'm very glad that I, I, I can like to describe how lucky I, I am to be picked as the first, um, first winner. Since, uh, since I've been working on this project, I try to pitch it to everyone I know and sometimes, you know, people are very busy. They won't like answer your um, phones or uh, they won't reply your emails. And at that time, when I first step on the, in, to the classroom, which uh, where they have, there, are, there were like uh, over 200 professionals who all, cares about, uh, who all care about the same topics as I. I do. Like they all uh, want to know how can we improve the lives of elderly people. And I was very excited and I'm glad that I got this chance and thank you for, thank you for Stanford to hold this competition. And it's definitely helped me to uh, gain many uh, publicity. And so it's uh, actually helped me to connect it to more people such as like the biggest uh, uh, our, our national uh, biggest caregivers, caregiver organizations. Yeah, and also the biggest uh, national distributors in the state for uh, medical products. And after that, I do um, a very uh, important decision is to see how can I have my project found. So. I choose one of the I choose one of the way to found my project is to do the crowdfunding. So is everyone here knows about crowdfunding or anyone don't know about it? So everyone knows. Yeah, it's a very popular way. And it's another it's actually um, another very overwhelming experience to me that I run the campaign for 60 days and I can I'll say I feel like during that time, like my phone was getting texts like every minute. So I have to answer all the emails and that's, that's really fantastic because I got all the feedbacks and it's, there are many um, benefits from doing this and I, I'm, uh, I'm glad that uh, the campaign reached a goal for uh, 76,000. And I actually want to talk about this. So, uh, I want to talk about why I choose to uh, this approach to found my um, product because I I actually have many um, opportunity to partner with bigger companies or to uh, find a uh, work with the angel founder to work on this. But I really want to um, decide my direction to develop this product, and so. 
and after I run the two month campaign, I can share with you my experience is the campaign actually uh, helped me to define my target users even better. For example, I got many emails talking about, oh, so have you ever think about um, that your product can actually be used by people who have visual impairment? Because the brightly colored tableware actually helped them to uh, distinguish the table, tableware. And the second one is I actually got a lot of, um, lot of people to contact me. For example, I only had one man, uh, like I only contact five manufacturers. And but at, uh, during the campaign, I at least got like 20 to contact me. And they say, I'm very interested in, and uh, um, we can give you more information and or we can check on your models. And of course, I still have to be aware of um, like contract things, but it's, it's definitely help help me to connect it to those people who I might partner with. And also, um, I was able to connect it to more um, distributors. Um, for example, um, I was very, I remember one of this particularly, I'm very glad to be connected to is uh, Tipa Snow. She is a very uh, famous, well-known uh, caregiver in, in, um, in the States. And I know about her because when I was doing my project in 2010, I know about her. I was watching her video every day at home. So when I got a call from her office, I was very excited. And, um, and there they, uh, we're t still talking about how can we uh, work together. And also the manufacturers, distributors, and also the founder. Actually, many people contact me and say, hey, do you need more money to work on this? And it's, it's actually hard to say no to people if they want to give you more money. And, uh, and of course, the um, public publicity. And I think the most uh, fascinating effect by ha uh, to get more publicity is I can have more people to know about it. And it's everywhere, and people will know uh, who is the person who first worked on the project as well. So it's very important. And also, I expand uh, my market to uh, internationally. So this is some pictures. I, I try to uh, rec uh, record every step I, um, I developed this project. This is just a few of them. like. Um, during the time I run my project, I was able to um, uh, connect to the CEO of the Indiegogo campaign because um, our campaign was selected. Um, they only picked three to uh, like work with, and when they participate in other um, partner with other companies, so they, our campaign is featured was featured at that time, and I was invited to go on sound like a TV news or radio shows. And it's really interesting. <laughs> and I was also uh, been, uh, been. I'm very glad to be invited to um, speak at a conference in Korea and also Taiwan. So I'm very <laughs> glad I have this chance. So yeah, this is pretty much I have right now. And we are planning to deliver the final products in June this June. And very exciting too. Okay. So you're talking about two aspects of your project. One is coming up with the initial website. Yes. And then you talked a lot about getting it to market. Yes. Which which was harder and by how much? How much both? How much was either I assume that getting the product to market was much more difficult than designing it initially, right? Yes. By how much? A factor of two, ten, a hundred? Oh, uh, okay. Actually, I pretty much very missed the time when I was to de develop the product. Because <laughs> at that time, I think my schedule is really simple. Like, I, um, I have to arrive school at night, then work till 12 o'clock, then just go back and sleep. And every day is like that. And everything I have to be aware of is to 
do good design. And uh, it's really good. But the business side, actually, uh, it's kind of interesting too, but it's more tricky. I will say, no, I'm not a positive person, so I'll say maybe 50 50, but I was like 80 more enjoy the design and 20 enjoy the business side because I'm a design background. Yeah, but it's really a different world. Like after I finish, I won't say finish my design because there's no end for design. But um, when I go to this stage and I think the business part is really a whole new different world. Yeah, I have to learn so many different things and because um, I'm um, like a very early startup so I have to work on every de uh, like very detail, uh, small details. For example, the there are, there are many obstacles actually, like, um, but it's, it's fine, I just have to, yeah, just like design something we always been teach to problem solving <laughs> all the time. Yeah, it's, it's actually the same, yeah. Who are your competitors for this product? Um, when I was doing the design until now, the only competitive product as a whole set is another uh, tableware set, and they made the, the whole set in red. Yes. Daniel, what is the current state of your market or your go-to-market strategy right now? Like, is it on the market yet? Oh no, it's it's not in the market yet. But uh, we are contacting those distributors and. Another reason I really want to uh, run my campaign is people are asking for samples. But it's hard for me to make so many different pieces at the same time and deliver the samples to them. So I'm glad that um, this campaign can help. Um, did you run into uh, significant engineering challenges with kind of getting materials that uh, were both uh, kind of like non slip in? Yes. Actually, I just finished a meeting at noon today, and I was talking to another person who was working on also plastic uh, dinnerware and a uh, kitchenware actually. And my answer is um, actually we just it's really depends on because if you approach to different manufacturers, they actually will give you different answers. You can just give them all your requirements. And of course, you have some basic knowledge about those material. But based on my experience, each uh, manufacturer will give you different opinions on the material. But if you ask for the specific material, they will, they will say that. And they will help you to solve those problems. And another way I try is I try to find like either people who work on this before and um, also like big brands such like SOS. They also made like plastic products. So I just check on their website to see what kind of material they use. Or it, it's, it's even better if I can find people who actually take care of their manufacturing process. Yeah. It's, yes. it's, a, it's a very good question. And also I'm curious because I'm going through it myself. Um, oh, okay. With PCTs and the cost of legal, I personally fit $100,000. Yes. <laughs> so how do you do that? Uh, I'll say I'm very lucky because my partner actually is a patent lawyer. Wow. So, <laughs> so he actually helped me a lot on this. Okay. Yeah, so maybe you can. <laughs> yeah, yes. Is your business strategy to actually manufacture and sell this yourself, or do you want to license it to somebody and throw it in the marketplace? Uh, right now, I will prefer to find good partners to work with because I, I figure out like my passions is still on design 
if I really want to sell it by myself, I probably have to have my own team, like sales team or sales after service team to work on this. So for now, it's, I will choose to like find a suitable distributors to, to help me out. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It seems like uh, the kitchenware manufacturer, uh, OXO, mm -hmm. uh, that immediately came to mind. It seems like uh, so you wouldn't have to worry about the manufacturing logistics and just license it and something like that. That would be mm -hmm. convenient. Um, have you thought about approaching, when you go to market, regardless of how you get there, have you thought about going straight to consumer retail versus uh, trying to distribute into a whole chain of rehabilitation centers or anything like that? Mm, right now, I'll say I'll do uh, B2B first, like company to company, because it's uh, much easier, much faster. And besides those uh, facilities are uh, very focused on like um, those like cognitive impairment care. And I was thinking if those professionals who work on this every day can use my product and they recognize it can really help their clients, then everyone can use it later. They can, yeah. How dishwasher safe is this product? Uh, it can be dishwasher safe. Yes. Yeah, the top, <laughs> top chef. <laughs> Okay, if there's no more questions, let's uh, thank Chow for the presentation. And for people who haven't been in this class before, you know, uh, the video and the slides are, are posted on the, on the course website. And the final for this year's